Welcome back to Change Ed. Changed. There it is. <laughs> Your under 15 minute podcast about education, all the changes that are happening in education. And right now we're specifically focusing on steals. I am your number one favorite host of all time, Andrew Kuhn. I am a project consultant at Montgomery County Intermediate Unit. And here with me competing for co-host position currently is... Tony Marabito. And I just want to put it out there that we got multiple emails, multiple uh, Twitter DMs that the show would crumble without me as your uh, co-host. So yeah, that's, that's thank you to my family and... Uh, Go ahead. Fake news. Yeah. That's hurtful. I've been here for one episode. Don't you want to say your title, Tony? Staff Development Facilitator. Wow. Yeah. Great. Great to have you here. And here with us also, still interviewing, is Patrice Sovacek, also out of the Montgomery County Intermediate. Wow. It is super great to be in the same space with both of you. I feel the love every time we get together to record. <laughs> Thank you. It's a real, real treat uh, as we lead up to the holiday season. <laughs> Continuing our conversation on three-dimensional learning, uh, we're going to pivot a little bit as we dive deeper into this. And we, I just want to touch on how do the three dimensions work together? So we talked about what they were and kind of them separate. But, you know, the strength of anything is how do we integrate it so that it's working together? They're not meant to be silos. We presented them as their individual silos, but now we're bringing them together. And in this analogy that we use with the three pillars for education, we talked about knowing, thinking, and doing. The knowing, thinking, and doing are all things that we can actually find represented in these new steel standards. Knowing is actually our uh, disciplinary core ideas, right? So that's the... The, how are we going to divide up all of these sciences or our tech or our engineering or our, our environmental literacy? How are we going to divide that up? So we're dividing it up and kind of giving everything a category. As our body of knowledge continues to grow, new things appear, right? And we, we find out where do they go? Where should we place them? How do we put them somewhere? Our thinking is actually our cross-cutting concepts. How are we organizing things? Are we looking for patterns or are there systems? How are we putting things together, where are we putting them together? And then finally, doing would be our science and engineering practices. How are we actually going to engage with this? And there's actually, interestingly enough, a lot of crossover that we find and that we see there. So I, I'm curious, I'm going to actually throw this first question to Patrice, um, is, you know, what does it look like for a student in a classroom where they're using these three dimensions? I'm, I'm curious, is this somehow expand learning and opportunities or you know is this could this move be a mistake well that's a that's a pretty loaded loaded question there um i think that it can 100 percent expand learning and allow students to have opportunities to think differently maybe not think differently they come in thinking differently and in historically we have schooled them into thinking the way that we want them to think. And I believe what this does is it allows opportunities for kids to experience thinking in a contained kind of way that allows them to freely make mistakes and learn from learn from what they're they're going through there. Well, first I'd like to say I obviously sent that question to you first because Tony would you know it would have been dead air. And secondly <laughs> why do you continue to be subjected to this Tony? I don't understand. That's a great question. My mom's my number one fan. Yeah. Um I want to piggyback off of what Patrice oh, said actually with, uh, with the dead air. Um, maybe we need a new boat. I think I think it's less of playing the game of school when you're when you're tying these three dimensions in um for students that you know are they can memorize vocab they can regurgitate facts that their teacher says i think this allows students that need that hands-on minds on to steal a term from you um to be able to dive in and learn something for themselves rather than be given all the answers like the vocab first and all of the, the natural discovery that happens in, in 3d learning um at really any grade level i think changes the game for kids that struggled with here's um, some vocab and here's a multiple choice test and show me what you've learned in that kind of manner. I really like that. And it reminds me of this phrase that I feel like is being thrown around all the time that we need to shift from as educators shift from being the sage on the stage. And I hate this phrase and I'm going to say it again, but uh, to being the guide on the side, because 
what that allows for is less of that recipe piece that we were talking about in the last episode and more of that exploration piece where kids are given the opportunity to think about what they're doing and then automatically apply it into uh, the new concepts that they're, they're moving forward with. Something else that you had said triggered this for me, and I think it's really important that we transition from putting up walls and barriers for students to like being able to transition them into speed bumps, right? Like there are going to be challenges that come along the way, but these walls and barriers, where I think we all learned in a very similar era and style, minus Tony, is that you had to know the vocabulary. You had to know the terms to be able to enter into the space. And that is strictly focused on knowing. You had to know to then be able to possibly do, right? We talked about that last episode. It was like, that was a carrot at the end of the stick. If you know everything, then you can do it. And really what we're talking about is like, let's make scientists. Let's get in there, right? Like science is not a cut and dry. I know all the answers. Now I can do the experiment. I told you, and it came out to be the way it was. It's very much about like, let's Let's go, right? Let's roll up our sleeves. Let's get into it. I actually don't know. It's about being curious, not about knowing. And somehow, maybe specifically in education, we kind of lost our way with that. We got a little confused. And again, it's a big body of knowledge that keeps growing, right? Think, you know, back to the experience of like Pluto. Is it a planet? It's not a planet. It's a moon. It's a star. It's a, you know, a ball that floats in the air. It's, it's not, not a star. It's ever a star. Oh, it wasn't ever a star? No. It sounded good. It felt good. Now it doesn't feel good. It like you, when you did it, it didn't feel good. Sorry, I don't want I don't want the four listeners that are still here to think that you think Pluto was ever a star. Pluto is a star. <laughs> Just don't Google it or ask Chat GPT. So um one of the important things that, with steels that should be noted as well is there is a focus the way it was designed and this three dimensional learning is a big part of it is how do we how do we intentionally try to capture all of our learners not just some of our learners but all of our learners and and enable that deep love of education so they can be lifelong learners not just in your classroom right so <clears throat> short term is like they loved your class and you're their favorite fifth grade teacher But long term is like, I really learned how to think. I really learned how to get hands on and how to ask ask the right questions. Not that there are wrong questions, but asking a question without already giving the answer. So I'm wondering, Tony, uh, to be an equal opportunity person here and throw you the first question. Can you think of, of what that might look like for you in your adult life? And I'll give you a little more background. Like, you know, do you feel like you tend to more you come to answers because you know you you know the answer like are you pulling from background you're like okay this is what it must be or do you you open it you approach it kind of more open-minded and you're like how can we work through this and find the answer i don't want to make any assumptions along the way well i think that's a a skill in and of itself is to be able to be collaborative with others when thinking through something so that's another skill that these students will pick up uh, when using 3d learning because they have to listen to each other they're, everyone's bringing their own kind of background knowledge. And I think that happens in most adult situations too. When I told you you're a horrible host, but then we talked it out and, and you, we and, and you became better. Right. <laughs> that's, that's why we have Patrice now, um, because we can't care us. But uh, I think being able to do some research, being able to see examples of something that can help, you know, it, as an adult and as a, a student. So um, being able to pull in additional information, and seek other opinions or do additional research, I think that helps adults and students alike. We talk a lot about in education about soft skills, right? These are things that we want to work on and develop. And what's interesting is that um, in a lot of ways, if we open up the ways that we, we are in teaching and instructing our students, we can open up avenues for soft skills in a different way. When we're only focusing on one dimension, it's like, well, those don't matter as much. We're going to focus on this. But if we put them in situations where they need to also think and process, we can put them in situations to communicate. And then if we, you're doing, you need to be able to talk and work together. Yeah, I think I think we talk about the four C's separately when they are just seen on a in every lesson when you're doing 3D learning, right? Yeah. Collaborating, being creative, critical thinking. You're doing all those things naturally without having to say, okay, now we're going to practice SEL. You know, so it kind of just uh, allows itself to be mixed into almost any lesson that you're doing. 
So instead of four lowercase C's, it's one big capital C that can all, all go together and work work oh, together. Yeah. yeah, that's uh, trademarked, by the way. So if anybody wants to use that, please talk to my lawyer. Patrice, uh, I'm curious what this, this looks like um, and what you think the impacts are for teaching and trying to capture all the students in the room versus, uh, you know, when, you know, we know that we're not necessarily doing that in education. Everybody's working really hard. We're doing, we're doing amazing work in education. Could this be an opportunity for us to embrace and actually make some changes that might capture more students? Yeah, I think that a lot of times what three-dimensional learning does is a natural differentiator. I don't even know if that's a word, but I made that up. I guess we can talk to your boy about trademarking that too. Um, I think that what this allows for is multiple entry points without having to put too much of the ownership on the teacher to think of 14 different ways of presenting information. And so when we set up things like, I know we're not talking about phenomenon right now, but when we set up things like anchoring phenomenon and then pull it back and do all these secondary phenomena that go along with it, we are layering in the learning. And so we have entry points for all kids along the way. And the other part um, that I keep thinking about is uh, another portion of my job. I work a lot with gifted and advanced learners. And again, all of those students that I come in contact with struggle with this kind of thinking because they do very much want the recipe because it is what they're so used to. And so um, what I think this does for those kids is allows them to experience a struggle in a safe environment without it becoming too impactful on their grades or anything like that, but it allows them opportunities to um, struggle and therefore increase their ability to think outside the box. And listening to you talk actually makes me want to change something I said before I said that, um, you know, the three dimensions were tools in your toolkit, but in a lot of ways, I actually want to change it to say that this is, um, you know, almost like a pair of goggles or lenses that you put on that you then see the world differently and you interact with it differently. So it's not just like, let me grab this thinking when it's convenient. It's like, how do I engage everyone? And this is one way to do that, right? Like if, if, if thinking and processing through isn't your thing, or if you need more time to do that, you can have that time. Uh, if, if knowing and being able to retain that information is your thing, right? Like it changes the element of group work and gives, uh, offers a job for everyone. So listen, a closing thought that I just want to say, uh, and you can take this to the bank, not only is Pluto a star, wow. but <laughs> wow. but uh, three-dimensional learning is, is something for us to just look at and consider, right? How can we make an approach and approach our students to involve them differently and intentionally? And maybe sometimes the way for us to actually go faster doing things is to actually slow down. So when we feel like we don't have time, maybe that's because we need to take or make the time and that something is that important. If it's important enough, we find ways to make the time. We will continue the conversation. And thanks to Patrice, we had a, a softball thrown at us. Maybe we should pivot a little bit and include phenomenon in the conversation. Tony, thank you for not contributing anything to a pivot of the next part that we're going to talk about. We look forward to connecting with you next time.